Good, good morning, Sunday School. This is Easter Sunday. This is the day that we've set aside to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. We call it Resurrection Sunday because it means so much to us Christians. And I hope you have spent the week celebrating the week, spent the week reflecting on what Jesus did for each and every one of us, what he did for us when we didn't even know him, what he did for us before we were ever born. And today, coming from the book of Isaiah, we're going to see just that dramatic change that Jesus went through to secure our salvation. We will be coming out of Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 11. So if you want to grab your Bible so you can read along, I will be reading out of the international version today. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day, Father, that we remember what you've sacrificed for us, Father. We're so grateful. We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. Father, I pray for those that are listening in to the Sunday school lesson today, Father, that it would be placed on our hearts, Father, to remember what you did for us, even when we didn't know we needed you, Father. You know we needed you, and we thank you for it. I pray, O oh Lord, that the lesson that's taught today, that something would be placed on our hearts, Father, that would make us become more the people you have called us to be. Help us to reflect on who you would want us to be, Father, and help us to reflect on where we are in our walk with you, Father, that we might continue to run on to see what the end will bring. And Father, I give you glory, give you honor, give you praise, and it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read to you out of, uh, like I say, Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 11, and we're going to be coming out of the international version. And it reads, Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the Lord, and the, excuse me, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. That ends our printed text reading. Let's talk a little bit about Isaiah, who, who wrote uh, the book of Isaiah. And we know Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. And there's a difference in just being a prophet and the, the ones that delivered the message from God. Prophets talked about what was yet to come. And we see the book of Isaiah talks a lot about what is to come. Isaiah prophesied starting in about 740 B.C. And he would tell what God told him and he would pass it on to the people. Isaiah did not pass good messages to the people because they were in a rebellious state against God. Isaiah prophesied about their being uh, going into captivity, he prophesied about them not being faithful to God, about their obedience and what was the results of obedience. So he was by no means a popular person with the Israelites because he called them out on what he saw. God gave him a message. He didn't dilute the message. It wasn't a pretty message. He did not dilute it. He done exactly what God wanted him to do. He foretold what God told them that was going to happen. And Isaiah not only foretold 
the future to the Israelite. He foretold the future so far in advance. He foretold about Jesus in 740 BC. So we can see that there was a, a lot of stress and pressure on Isaiah, but he stuck to his guns. He delivered the message that God wanted him to deliver. So we're going to look at today's lesson, and our title is called The Suffering Servant. And I know as I did, when you listen and read these words, it will pierce your heart. It did mine to know what Jesus had to endure and to know that he willingly did it. So let's look deeper into our scriptures. The first uh, verse four says, surely he took up our pains and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Now in biblical days, they had the assumption that if something bad was happening to you, that you had displeased God and it was your just punishment what you were receiving. And we know that is not the case and especially not the case with Jesus. It says he took up our pain, man, yours. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. That was something we should have gone through, but Jesus took it up for us. It says, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him with affliction. They cons uh, considered, since Jesus was doing all this suffering on the cross, it was because he had been disobedient. He had done something to God, and God was punishing him. Jesus was taking on our punishment. The next verse says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. I'm trying to find some notes I'd made. But if you just look at those words that are there, you can just feel the, the weight of what's going on. You can feel what they're talking about. Found it. You can just feel that, that he was pierced. That means he was punctured, wounded for our transgressions. Not for anything he did, but our transgressions. And, and our transgressions just us overstepping the limits of God. The things that God has told us not to do, we continue to do it. It says he was crushed. And when you think of crushed, ooh, this is just a powerful lesson. When you think of crushed, it is just really to press or to squeeze by force. He was crushed for our iniquities. And our iniquities is just our sin. It's gross injustice, a wickedness that we have done. He was crushed for ours. And again, this talks about us. And if you could just put your name in the place of where they say us, call yourself by name. When he says he was pierced for Mary's transgressions, he was crushed for Mary's iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The punishment that should have gone to mankind, Jesus bore that for us. And Isaiah's telling us this years before Jesus ever came on the scene. 700 or more years before Jesus appeared, Isaiah's telling them what is going to happen, who's going to save them, and how. But he knows they're not, God knew they were not going to accept him. And he's giving them that vivid picture that they can see what's happening to the suffering servant, just like our title said, the suffering servant. And a servant is no more than someone's obedient to the master. And Jesus was a servant of God, and he was obedient to God regardless of the cost and the consequences. It says, by his wounds, we are healed. Every stripe he took, every time they hit him with that, that whip, that was a stripe for something we should have endured. And because he took on this, because he accepted all this punishment, it says we are healed. Not only will he give us physical healing, but he will give us our spiritual healing. He will give us the, 
freedom from sin. That's what we need to be healed from. We need to be healed from sin because just by nature, just by nature, we were born as sinful people. We do have a choice of sinning or not sinning, but it's in our nature. It's our desire to want to sin, but God has given us the power to resist sin, to turn away from sin. And not only did he give us the willpower to turn away, he has given us Jesus that can help us in resisting sin. And because it's part of our nature, God had to send his son to take that on. Because if you go back to Old Testament, you will know they made sacrifices. They made sacrifices for sin to God. God could not let sin go unpunished. He could not, not his nature. So he could not let sin go unpunished. So he gave them a way to repent from that. They made sacrifices. They made animal sacrifices. Instead of themselves being killed, they would kill a lamb or, or whatever animal they had and offer that to God as repentance for the sin that they had committed. So this is basically what Jesus is doing for us. The next verse is six says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own ways and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We are like sheep, not that we are sheep, but we are like sheep for the simple fact, you know, sheep, they consider them to be sort of dumb animals. I don't know that they're really dumb animals, but they're easily led astray. They really don't have a lot of reasoning. They see something, they wander off to check it out, and then they can get lost from the, the herd or whatever. That's why they need a shepherd to keep them on the right track, to take them to the places they need to go to eat, to make sure they get back into the corral safely. So he's telling us that we are like sheep and we have gone astray. We have wandered out of that corral and we've turned to our own ways. We're no longer following the ways of God. We're following our own way because we think we know best. And God knows that was not the best for us. But because we've gone astray and sin requires punishment, it says, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And when I love it, laid upon him the iniquity of us all. I can just feel the burdens that Jesus was feeling as he was there on that cross being beaten and tortured and all of this weight of the world is on him. He had no way out. He had no way out. But I had to remember what Jesus said. They don't take my life. I lay it down for you and for me. Praise God. Mm. Verse 7 says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was oppressed and afflicted. Now, when we think of the word oppressed, it's just a load, a heavy burden that's unreasonably placed on someone. Uh, it's unjust. It's hardship. He was oppressed and afflicted with ours, but yet he did not open his mouth. Jesus did not protest against these false accusations that had been put on him, for he knew his duty. He knew what his purpose was. It was hardship for him, but he willingly did it. And we know for a split second there, Jesus was out of the presence of God with the weight of all the sins of the world resting on him. It says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. You know, when they got ready to use the lambs as sacrifices, they would actually take them. Their sheep didn't have a clue what was going on. You know, they would just take him there. The sheep is doing what the sheep does because he doesn't have a clue of what's about to happen. So it says Jesus was led like a lamb to slaughter, but he stayed silent. He did not open his mouth. Now, we know all Jesus had to do is he'd been doing this whole time he'd been on earth. He could speak anything into existence. He could speak the storms would calm. He could speak 
the lame would walk. He could speak, the blind would see. He could speak and you could be healed. But Jesus said in his defense, not a word, not a word. Verse 8 says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And again, when we think of oppression, we think of that, that heavy, burdensome load that he's got to carry. And judgment, he was taken away. The judgment, judgment that Jesus got was very unjust because they acute, made false accusations about him. They accused him of things and they found him guilty, even though he was not guilty. They found him guilty. And the other part of verse 8 says, Yet who of his generation protested? This should have been the Israelites. The Jews should have been protesting. They did not. As a matter of fact, they were given a choice. Jesus of Barabbas. What did they do? They chose the known murderer to be released and said, crucify Jesus. Why? They had no cause. They should have protested. This was the person that had been talked about for generations that were coming. He's standing there in their face, and they said not a word. As a matter of fact, like I said, they cheered on to crucify him. The other part of verse 8 says, For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was punished. Talking about his death. He was cut off from the land early in life. We know he was about 33 years old. He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he were punished. Transgressions, sin. When we overstep the limits of God's law, we are sinning. And he said, for those, for the sins of the people, he would be punished. Verse 9 says, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And they're talking about, here's this just man, falsely accused, being tried, being Put on the cross between two thieves. These are the wicked people. They knew the two thieves knew they, they, they were there rightfully. They had done evil. They had done what they should not have done. And their punishment was justified. Jesus' punishment was not justified. The only harsh thing Jesus did through his whole ministry was the time he went in and flipped over the money changers' tables there at the temple. Other than that, he had been doing good. He'd been healing people. He'd been encouraging people. He'd been, uh, uh, I guess, taking up for people against the, the Pharisees and all of them. He was telling them how unjust they were to the people, how they were telling the people all this wrong information and leading them astray. He had been doing everything right, but yet he was assigned a grave with the wicked. Hey, but then look, it says, and with the rich in his death, once Jesus had been crucified on the cross and died, then he was, Aramaeus came and got, asked for his body, and he put him in a brand new tomb that obviously he had carved out for himself, but he had Jesus put in there. He says, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, innocent man they had crucified innocent man. Verse 10 says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, sin required an offering. There was no, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. God required a offering or a sacrificial offering for any sin that his people had committed. For he, that's the type of God he was. He could not let sin go unpunished. And for years on years on years, he had been letting them use animals and, and uh, grains and, and different kind of offerings for the different sins they had committed. But at some point in time, that no longer became enough. And God had said, I'm going to make one ultimate sacrifice. 
one ultimate sacrifice to take care of all of this. And that's what Jesus became. He became that one sacrifice that would last the test of time. It would not have to be done again. It would not have to be gone over and over and over again, uh, bringing sacrifices every time we sin. So the last verse, excuse me, verse 11 says, oh no, I'm sorry, rest of verse 10 says, he will see his offsprings and prolong his days and, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. When it says he will see his offsprings, it was talking about the disciples, the followers of Jesus, those that would follow him. He would see the fruits of his labor. He would see those of us that have come to call him Lord and Savior, those of us that are turned away from sin and turned toward God. He would see that. He would see those of us that are continuing to spread the good news. And it says, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What God wants done, Jesus would do, and it would prosper. More and more people will be brought into the fold. Verse 11a says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Once Jesus died on the cross, if we go to Hebrews 2 and 2, it says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is now sitting on the right hand of God. He's sitting there interceding for us, some sinful people. So when you look at the title of this, when it talks about the suffering servant, make no mistake about it, Jesus suffered and he suffered for us. How many of us are willing to suffer for someone else, to go in someone else's place willingly, willingly go? Because again, Jesus said, they don't take my life. I lay it down. I give it to them because he had the power not to stay on that cross. He had the power to smite everybody that was standing around the cross watching. He had the power. But in order to fulfill what God needed, which was that substitutionary sacrifice that could never uh, go away, Jesus had to. He had no choice. He had to go to the cross if he wanted to save God's people. If he wanted to save all those that would believe in God, there was no other way. There was no other way except the way of the cross. So as we reflect on Isaiah, like I said, Isaiah done this over 700 years before Jesus ever came on the scene. He was trying to prepare them for who was coming. And he was also telling them, this is how you're going to treat him. You would think they would have the priest at least would have went back through scripture and they would found these notes and they would eyes would be open to say, we can't do this because of this is what's been told. They never, they never, it never dawned on them, I guess, to, to do anything except self-satisfaction, to take care of self. They didn't want Jesus to have any more accolades than they could get. They didn't like Jesus because he contradicted what they said because what they were saying and doing was against the law of God. And Jesus came, he said, I came to fulfill the law, not to beat you over the head with it. And that's what the Pharisees and the, and the priests were doing, beating the people over the head with the law that they themselves could not even follow. So Jesus had to come that all of us would have equal chance. You know, sometimes the scale of justice is not even. The scale of justice is not even. The rich may get off, the poor can't because they can't afford the mouthpiece to, to get them off. Jesus gave us all equal justice. There is no big I and little you when it comes to Jesus' sacrifice on that cross. It was for all of us. I thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Let me give you scripture for uh, next week. 
we're going to come out of the book of Ezra. That's a big jump. We're coming out of the book of Ezra, chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this lesson. Oh, open up our hearts and minds that we want to be faithful. We want to do what you want us to do. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. Bless us, Lord, till we return again to hear your word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.